Hello and welcome to this session on Doctrine of Modes. Modes are particular modifications of substance, that is, particular things in the world. Spinoza gives the following definition. By mode, I understand the affections of a substance, or that which is in another, through which it is also conceived. According to Descartes, a mode is a determinate way of being a principal attribute. All modes of a body are determinate ways of being extended. Examples of modes of a body would include squareness, being 2 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches being unified. All modes of mind are determinate ways of being thought. Example, imagining a unicorn, believing I will have steak for dinner tonight, wishing you would go away, etc. Immediately after wrapping up his proof for substance monism, Spinoza claims in the next proposition that whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. The definition of mode implies that everything that exists other than God is a mode or affection of God. To understand the import of this claim, it is important to understand what a mode is and what is it for a mode to be in a substance for Spinoza. A natural way to think about modes is as a certain kind of property. The circular shape of the coin on the desk is a mode of that coin. On this reading, being circular is a state of the coin, a particularized way that the coin is. Spinoza's claim that modes are in their substances also suggests that modes in her in substances akin to the way that properties in her in things, and that modes are therefore predicable of substances as subjects of predication. Circularity, we might say, inheres in the coin, and the coin is circular. Of course, there is an extremely wide range of views about properties and property bearers. So, claiming that modes are akin to properties that inher in substances will not answer all questions. But even putting aside questions about inherence, property instantiation, and predication relations, it may seem like Spinoza has made a colossal blunder. After all, how can a table or human being be anything like a property? How can we in her in something else? It would be disappointing if this objection simply assumed from the outset that a. Objects like tables and human beings are substances and b. Substances neither in her in nor are predicable of other substances. Spinoza agrees with b, but he has already argued pace a that there can be only one substance. It would be unfair to grant him that conclusion and then insist upon reading that other things still ought to have all the features of substances. Interpreters have tried to make sense of Spinoza's identification of everyday objects with modes without presupposing the denial of his substance monism. One strategy would be to deny that Spinoza intends anything like property inherence and predication by his identification of everyday objects with modes of God. On this interpretation, Spinoza's claim about modes are really just claims about the causal dependence of all things on God. Everyday objects inherit in God in the sense that they depend causally on God. When Spinoza claims whatever is, is in God, he really means only that everything is causally dependent on God, a fantastically unremarkable claim in the 17th century. Indeed, as others have objected, this proposal makes Spinoza's claim so unremarkable that it is hard to see why Spinoza went to such obfuscating lengths to phrase his ontology in terms of modes and inherence in the first place, since he had the categories of efficient causation and dependent beings at his disposal. Why did Spinoza bother to talk about inherence and imminent causation at all? A different strategy preserves the inherence link between modes and properties, but understands Spinoza's modes as particularized accidents, or in contemporary terms, tropes. According to this reading, collections of particularized properties constitute everyday objects for Spinoza. The first interpretation explained inherence as nothing but efficient causation 
This reading tries to keep causation and inherence intentionally distinct metaphysical dependent relations. Another, more circuitous option begins with a functional account of modes in Spinoza's ontology. The function of modes is to provide ways of expressing or conceiving the power of substance. Perhaps Spinoza actually provides an analysis of inherence in terms of his expressive or conceptual relation, similar to the way in which he provides an analysis of causation in terms of conceptual connection. Consider, for instance, Spinoza defines substance as that which is A in itself and B is conceived through itself, that is, C, that whose concept does require the concept of another thing from which it must be formed. Instead of leaving inherence as an unprincipled primitive relation of metaphysical dependence, one could read C as providing an analysis of both A and B. One thing inheres in another in virtue of being conceived through it, which, like causation, is a matter of conceptual involvement. That everyday objects are modes inhering in and predicated of substance is extensionally and intentionally equivalent to everyday objects being conceived through substance. Different interpretations of Spinoza's ontology of modes will yield alternative accounts of his views on the necessity of modes. For purposes of ease and neutrality, it is frequently referred to modes as objects, which is intended to be a neutral placeholder for whatever else exists besides substance. The modality of modes, an overview. Earlier, we noted that Spinoza thinks that infinitely many non-substantial objects exist. From the necessity of the divine nature, they must follow infinitely many things in infinitely many ways, that is, everything which can fall under an infinite intellect. Although Spinoza means more by infinite than simply exhaustive, he clearly intends exhaustive as well. How many objects are there? as many as they can be together, is Spinoza's reply. That is, Spinoza endorses a principle of ontological plenitude, or POP, according to which the greatest number of composable non-substantial objects actually exist. Perhaps it would also be an undesirable brute fact if a maximal world with fewer objects than the actual world existed. What would explain God's realization of a smaller maximal collection when a larger maximal collection is possible? In any case, Spinoza's POP implies that the number of existing objects is necessarily fixed. Though this is already quite a strong conclusion, it does not yet rise to the level of a full-blown necessitarianism with respect to modes. There are still three possible sources of contingency for the maximally full world of modes. Alternative possibility 1. There could have been a different collection of modes, equal in size to the actually existing collection, but with entirely different members. Alternative possibility 2. For at least one individual member of the collection of actually existing modes, there could have been a different mode existing in its stead. Alternative possibility 3. At least one of the actual modes could have had different characteristics than it in fact has while still retaining its identity. The possibility of an entirely different equinumerous collection, different members of the collection, or some alternative features of members of the collection, or some combination of the three, are all compatible with the principle of ontological plenitude. If any of these alternatives are genuine possibilities for Spinoza, then he will not be committed to full-blown necessitarianism with respect to modes. Necessitarianism requires not only the necessity of the number of existence, it demands the necessity of each member and the necessity of all of its characteristics. Hence, even given principle of ontological plenitude, it remains an open question whether Spinoza wants to deny that there are any alternative possibilities for modes. To understand why Spinoza might be attracted to mode necessitarianism, we need to consider a few additional details of his ontology of modes. It is lumping modes together into a single ontological category, 
everything that is not a substance. But Spinoza sometimes distinguishes between two types of modes, infinite modes and finite modes. Unfortunately, Spinoza gives only a very sparse account of infinite modes in the ethics and he makes very few explicit textual references to them outside the ethics. When George Schuller wrote to Spinoza to ask him for examples of these curious entities, Spinoza replied with obscure gems like the face of the whole universe, motion and rest, and absolutely infinite intellect. If the best elucidation of the an elaborate philosophical doctrine makes reference to the face of the whole universe, that is a good sign that the doctrine needs further development. Unfortunately, for Spinoza's readers, infinite moods appear to do some significant work in his metaphysics, so they cannot simply be ignored if one wants to understand Spinoza's modal commitments. Infinite modes. The most salient feature of infinite modes is that they are more directly related to substance than finite modes are. Spinoza claims that infinite modes follow more or less directly from the absolute nature of any of God's attributes, whereas finite modes do not follow from the absolute nature of any of God's attributes. According to some interpreters, understanding this distinction is a key to understanding whether or not Spinoza was a full-blown necessitarian. At first glance, Spinoza's picture seems clear enough. Some modes follow directly from the absolute nature of substance. Interpreters frequently call these immediate infinite modes. Other modes follow directly from those immediate infinite modes. These are commonly called mediate infinite modes. There is then a gap of some kind and on the other side of the gap is the maximally full collection of finite modes. Unlike the infinite modes, particular finite modes do not follow either directly or indirectly from the absolute nature of substance. The distinction between infinite and finite modes is relevant for Spinoza's views on modality because of what he says about the modal status of infinite modes. Spinoza reasons that if an object necessarily follows from something that necessarily exists, then that object also necessarily exists. This sounds similar to a familiar and widely accepted modal axiom. According to this reasoning, if God necessarily exists, and if the existence of a mode follows necessarily from the existence and nature of God, then that mode necessarily exists too. Of course, we need not and should not interpret Spinoza's following from relation as a strict logical entailment of contemporary modal logic. The main point is that necessity transfers down the following from chain according to Spinoza. If X necessarily exists and if Y necessarily follows from X, then Y necessarily exists too. We can call this as the modal transfer principle. Notice that both conjuncts of the modal transfer principle must be satisfied if Y is to exist necessarily by virtue of the modal transfer principle. That is, for the modal transfer principle to apply to Y, it must be the case that both 1, Y necessarily follows from X and 2, X necessarily exists. To mark this point terminologically, we will use the older labels of hypothetical and absolute necessity. To keep matters simple, let us say that Y is hypothetically necessary if X contingently exists and Y necessarily follows from X. Let us say that Y is absolutely necessary if Y is hypothetically necessary and X necessarily exists. On this account, an object that is absolutely necessary may derive its necessity from an external source. If God's existence is absolutely necessary and the existence of a white host necessarily follows from God's existence, then the existence of a white host will be absolutely necessary. Whatever differences there may be between an object that exists necessarily in virtue of its own nature and one that exists necessarily in virtue of necessarily following from the necessity of another, that distinction is wholly internal to absolute necessity. Spinoza's modal transfer principle appeals to the relation of logical entailment. This means that 
Spinoza's following from relation shares the features of his causal relations, including the fact that causal relations involve necessary connections between relata. That is, if y follows from x, then given x, y necessarily follows from x. Furthermore, Spinoza claims that every mode follows from something else. There are no causal dead ends. It follows that every mode is either hypothetically or absolutely necessary for Spinoza. This is not yet to affirm necessitarianism, however, for hypothetical necessity is compatible with contingency. So the question remains, does Spinoza think every mode is absolutely necessary? In the case of existing infinite modes, Spinoza's answer is clearly yes. Spinoza claims that immediate infinite modes necessarily follow from the nature of something that exists with absolute necessity, namely substance. Therefore, by the modal transfer principle, the existence of every existing immediate infinite mode is absolutely necessary. Furthermore, since every mediate infinite mode necessarily follows from something that necessarily exists, their existence is also absolutely necessary. More generally, because there is a chain of necessary dependence stretching from the necessarily existing substance to every existing infinite mode, the existence of every existing infinite is absolutely necessary. Once again, even this strong model conclusion is not equivalent to full-blown necessitarianism regarding infinite modes. Even if every existing infinite mode necessarily exists, could there have been other infinite modes as well? It is not aware of any text in which Spinoza explicitly rules this out, but it is easy to imagine what he would have said. Merely possible infinite modes do not necessarily exist, or else they would actually exist, on the plausible assumption that whatever necessarily exists actually exists. What is the manner of Sophia's dependence on substance? Spinoza's discussion of infinite modes suggests that Sophia must, by definition, follow from God's absolute nature. If so, then Sophia follows from the absolute nature of God on the assumption that true definitions express necessary truths. But in that case, the modal transfer principle will apply to Sophia as well, in which case Sophia's existence is absolute necessary. However, again assuming that Sophia would not be a merely possible infinite mode after all, pays our initial assumption. Of course, that reasoning relies on possible world semantics and some loaded, though highly plausible, theses about relations between possible worlds. Perhaps Spinoza could reach a similar conclusion without recourse to all that. Spinoza could instead appeal back to his plentitude principle. If there could have been more infinite modes than there in fact are, these mere possibilia must be composable with the collection of necessarily existing infinite modes. But if there were infinite modes that were compassable with the collection of necessarily existing infinite modes and yet did not exist, what would explain their known existence? We again reach the conclusion of a necessitarianism with respect to every infinite mode. Like substance, all possible infinite modes are absolutely necessary. This conclusion is consistent with the fact that these modes nonetheless derive their necessity from substance. Finite modes, a first pass. Infinite modes are absolutely necessary because they necessarily follow from something that necessarily exists, namely God. What about finite objects like furniture and people? Are they absolutely necessary too, according to Spinoza? This much seems clear. If a finite mode follows from an infinite mode, or from the absolute nature of substance itself, then by the modal transfer principle, it exists with absolute necessity. But does any finite mode follow from an infinite mode, or from the absolute nature of substance? This is where the aforementioned gap between infinite and finite modes becomes significant. Spinoza says that no finite mode follows from either an infinite mode or from the absolute nature of an attribute of God, lest that mode be eternal and infinite, 
pays the nature of finite modes. If so, then perhaps Spinoza's point in this passage is that particular finite modes, like the desk, follow from only other particular finite modes, such as a factory, which themselves follow from only other finite modes, such as some trees and so on. If so, then it appears that finite modes will only be hypothetically and not absolutely necessary, in which case Spinoza is not a necessitarian. However, one might respond, suppose the causal chain of the desk is traced all the way back to its very beginning. Surely, the starting point of the universe, from which all the subsequent objects and events necessarily follow, surely that initial mode follows from God's nature or from one of God's infinite modes? If so, the initial mode will be absolutely necessary and everything that follows from it, including the desk, would be absolutely necessary too. Spinoza cannot accept this response. Spinoza explicitly denies that the series of finite objects has an initial starting point. Spinoza thinks that the causal history of the world extends in an infinitely long causal chain that contains no initial state. Think about that for a moment. For any prior cause of the desk, there will always be a prior cause of that cause, and a prior cause of the cause of that cause, and so on ad infinitum. Spinoza has little sympathy with the traditional monotheistic idea that God created the world ex nihilo. There is no true in the beginning style cosmogony according to Spinoza. If our present universe can be traced back to the Big Bang, Spinoza thinks there had to be a state prior to the Big Bang that caused the Big Bang and a state prior to that and so on. Is such an infinite chain intelligible? For every particular finite object, there is a sufficient reason for its existence and characteristics given in terms of its prior finite causes. Each finite object follows from and is thus explained by the prior state of the world, whose constituents are explained by yet prior state, and so on. If that is all Spinoza intended to say about the modal status of finite modes, then perhaps his fiery denials of contingency should be read as affirmations of universal hypothetical necessity and not universal absolute necessity. Let us summarize what we have just discussed. In Spinoza's crucial claim about finite modes, he states that particular finite modes a do not follow from the absolute nature of an attribute of God, although b they do follow from an attribute of God insofar as it is considered to be affected by some mode. Two questions immediately arise. One, what is the difference between following from the absolute nature of God and merely following from God in the second, more qualified manner? Two, why should the way a particular thing is considered be relevant for this distinction? To follow from the absolute nature of God is to follow in an unqualified, pervasive and permanent manner as infinite modes do. Clearly, Spinoza denies that finite modes follow in that way. However, following the God's nature in a more qualified way does not imply that finite modes do not follow from God at all. That would be to reintroduce the problem of the gap. Spinoza denies only that any particular finite mode follows from God's absolute nature independently of its relations to the other infinite objects. This leaves open the possibility that, although no particular finite mode follows from the absolute nature of God, the entire collection of finite modes as a whole follows from the absolute nature of God or from an infinite mode of God. Now you can try and answer the following questions. Explain the concept of doctrine of modes. Briefly narrate Spinoza's doctrine of modes. Distinguish between the doctrine of substance and doctrine of modes. Compare the views of Spinoza with Descartes. Hope that you may go through the reference for further reading. The Philosophical Writings of Descartes, published by the Cambridge University Press in 1985. The Essence of the Body and the Part of the Mind that is Eternal by Don Garrett, published in 2009 by Cambridge University Press.
the necessity of finite modes and geometrical containment in Spinoza's Metaphysics by Charles Huneman, published by the Oxford University Press in 1999. Confessio Philosophy and Papers Concerning the Problem of Evil by G.W. Leibniz in 2005, published by Yale University Press. Thank you for watching this program. We can meet again soon with another topic.